So this morning we're going to look at something in line with what we looked at last week. And I'm going to do a short review this morning um, of what we looked at last week, just to tie it together. This is going to be somewhat of an unplanned mini-series. Um, I don't know if I'll finish up next week or the week after. Hopefully I can get through, through this today. I normally only have, I've, I've determined that for me to have a reasonably lengthy, reasonable length of, of sermon that it needs to be four pages. And this morning it's six plus a couple of other pages that I would like to read. So you're going to have to hang on tight because we're going to go through this kind of quickly, some of these verses. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 11 and just put your finger in there. Ezekiel chapter 11. And quickly, I just want to review. Last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 12. I just want to read a quick portion of that. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares and entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> and we looked at, for us to be like Jesus, the thing we have to do in life is what? Take up our cross, right? Just like he did. And then we looked specifically and mostly at the discipline of God. And this morning, this is a, just a, a, another extension of how to how to handle the discipline of God. It says in, in verse 3 of Hebrews 12, For consider him who endured such hostility against sinners, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. And that's easy to do when we're being disciplined by God. You have not resisted to bloodshed striving against sin, and you've forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you, sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Like I said last week, I'll say again this week, the reason we're exhorted to not be discouraged is because it's what we're prone to do when we're getting dealt with. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son that he receives. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We looked at that, that, that in a, any normal family, and in my family, I'm not worried about other people's kids, I'm worried about my own. And if you're getting chastened by the Lord, it means that he loves you and that you're part of his family because he only, he only deals with those in his family. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there? whom a father does not chasing, chasten. But if you are without chastening, all of which, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So what he's saying there is if you've, just like I just mentioned, if you endure that chastening, take heart because that means you're one of his. Skipping down to verse 11, it says, no, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. How many of you know that's true? I know it's true in my life. It doesn't seem to be very joyful when I get chastened by the Lord. It's painful. Nevertheless, What's the end game? Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The peaceable fruits of righteousness, which I think we can all say we want, yet the road that we get there is very often, and most often I would say, through the chastenings and the dealings and the trials that the Lord sends our way. So that's just a very quick summary of what we looked at last week. And this morning, we're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 11, and we're going to start right in verse 19. The title of this sermon is A Heart Condition, A Heart Condition, and I want to briefly mention, I really appreciate what Brother Bob opened up with this morning because he had no idea what I was going to preach on. Did you, Brother Bob? No. And he talked about the, the, the hard ground of the heart, and I love it when the Lord confirms uh, what he wants to say this morning through other channels. It makes it a lot easier as we're talking to know that the Lord's in what you're saying and what you've prepared. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, it says, Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and this is an interesting phrase, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire of their, det of their detestable things, for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. He says, I will take a, the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. How many of you know what the flesh normally speaks about in the Bible? Carnality, right? The fleshly things. Well, this is one of the exceptions to that rule. A heart of flesh, what he's talking about here, and we're going to really get into this deep this morning, is something that's soft. 
something that's tender before the Lord. If you want to be able to accept the chastenings of the Lord and the disciplines of the Lord, then one of the main prerequisites is having a tender heart. We all have a heart condition. Even, even people that aren't saved very often have a heart condition, and we're going to look at that this morning. I mean, have you heard the phrase, oh, they've had a change of heart? Well, when you become a Christian, you, have, you do. You have a change of heart. But it's very easy to allow that heart to slip back into hardness. How many of you know Israel was God's chosen people, yet here he is talking about how he needs to take out their hard hearts, right? <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 36, if you want to flip over there for a second. Just a few chapters later. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 we find him, the Lord saying pretty much the exact same thing. It says, then I will, he says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Basically the exact same phrase he just said in Ezekiel chapter 11. <clears throat> I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Do you notice what always follows after the Lord gives someone a heart of flesh? Keeping his commandments. He says in chapter 11, they will walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. He says it again in, verse, in, in chapter 36, to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. Anytime the Lord repeats himself, it behooves us to stop for a second and focus in on what he's saying. Like I just said, the heart of flesh he's speaking here is not the heart of carnality. It's, it's, it's the exact opposite of that. It's soft. Another, another way you could say it is it's a humble heart. Humility. And the result is always a soft and pliable heart will cause us to walk in his ways and be obedient to them. Turn with me for a minute to chapter 3 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. We're going to do quite a bit of scripture reading here this morning. So, like I said, just... Be prepared to do some, let your fingers do some quick walking through your Bible. Hebrews chapter 3. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Notice the correlation there. Rebelliousness, rebellion equals a hard heart. Hardening is something that we do. Have you, do you notice how he, what he says? Do not harden you. The, the you is understood there in the English language. You don't harden your hearts as in the day of the rebellion. That means we have a job to play. Yes, the Lord gives us a new heart, but there's something that involves action on our part. Do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Notice what he just said there? Who, someone with a soft and tender heart of flesh, what do they do? They know the ways of the Lord, right? He just said that in chapter 11 and 36 of Ezekiel. But yeah, he's saying here in Hebrews, those who were in the tribe of Israel that went astray in their hearts, they didn't know his ways. So it's the reverse principle I always talk about. If, this, if, a plus, if 1 plus 1 equals 2, well then 2 minus 1 equals 1, right? It's, just, it's simple equations in math. If you have a soft heart, you're going to know his ways. If you have a hard heart, you're not going to know his ways. Going on in verse 11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. I want to stop just for a moment before we go on this morning. The first two words of, of verse 12. Beware who? Who does he talk to? Brethren. So who does that imply? Christians, you got it. Christians. He's not talking to the unsaved here. He's talking to the godly. Beware. As I've said so many times, and I will say it again and again, he doesn't exhort us in Scripture about certain things if we didn't have a propensity to not do those things. The fact that he's saying, hey, listen up, beware. It's like when my kids, when I'm talking to them and I'm correcting them about something, and I, and I want to really stress to them, I said, hey, pay attention to what I'm saying. You, under, you, you understanding? You listening to me? Yeah, I'm listening. Right? I make a very... A, a very pointed remark to them to listen to what I'm saying, to pay attention, to, to, to focus in on what's being said here. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you 
an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. That's what we're doing this morning. I'm exhorting you and me. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I believe that's, that's the main way you get a hard heart is through sin. And how many of you know sin is a very deceitful thing? It's a very deceitful thing. And I'm going to expound on that here in just a minute. Going on in four, verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not, what? Obey. Walking in his ways. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. And first this morning, I want to look at a few reasons, and there's a lot of them, but I'm just going to look at a few. A few reasons for a hard heart. The first thing I want to make mention is something I've, I've just got done saying. This is applicable to Christians. Hard hearts happen to Christians just like they are, it happens to the, to the unbelieving. As I said, in verse chapter 8, he said, do not harden your hearts. You don't harden your hearts. This is, this is applicable to us. He's talking to us, and hardening is something that we do. It's something that happens over time. And what I believe the main cause of it is sin. As I said, and as, he, as it said in Hebrews, it's deceitful. Anybody know why it's deceitful? Why is sin a deceitful thing? That's kind of an interesting phrase in, in, in Hebrews there. I believe sin is deceitful, and you'll all, I'm sure, have, have experienced this at one time or another. How many of you know, they talk, when, you, when, you're, when you're teaching kids about lies, you say what? A little lie turns into what? A bigger lie. Why? Because you, gotta, you tell one lie, and then you've got to tell another lie to cover up the first one you told, and you've got to cover up a third one to tell the, cover up the first and second one you told, and so on and so forth, until pretty soon it's this big, giant problem, right? Well, it's the same thing with sin. How many of you know the Bible says sin is pleasurable for a season? Right? And we give in to sin and we give in to the evil desires of our hearts. And, and, and it isn't from 1 to 100 immediately. It's a very slow, gradual process. You take a bite of the fruit and, oh, that tastes pretty good. I'll have another bite. And you take another bite and you take another and pretty soon you've eaten a whole piece of fruit, right? The whole apple, so to speak. It's a, sin is deceitful because it's a little at first and then over time it's more and more and more. The hardening is a slowly increasing process. That's why it's deceitful. Satan comes and tempts you with the little thing. He doesn't, he doesn't just come and tempt you. It's kind of like, I'm quite sure most alcoholics weren't alcoholics the first drink they ever took. They weren't drinking a fifth of whiskey, which I don't even know how much that is, by the way. But they weren't drinking this huge bottle of whiskey the first time they ever took a drink. I'm sure most drug addicts weren't shooting up with heroin the first time they ever tried drugs. It's very, and, and, and these are extreme examples, but they're, they're good for the point I'm trying to make. It's, you know, I'm going to have just a little drink. I'm just going to have a little, a little bit of drugs, a little bit of pot. That's, that's no big deal. That's a big push in our society today, right? Marijuana is just not that big of a deal, right? And then it slowly, it's, it, it, sin is a, it's a gateway. They call marijuana, for example, a gateway drug. Sin is a gateway. It, it becomes more and more, and pretty soon that little bit doesn't satisfy you. Now you need a little bit more to get the same effect. Right? You need a little bit more alcohol to get the same, same buzz you had before, and a little more, and a little more, and a little more. And before you know it, someone's life is completely ruined by the deceitfulness of sin because it's gradual, it's increasing. And it's so gradual and increasing, we don't even realize it's taking place. Another reason for a hard heart, and he talks very explicitly about this in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, is unbelief unbelief well it's kind of an odd thing to talk about to christians obviously we believe that's why we're called believers right so what exactly can we glean from this evil heart of unbelief that he's talking about well specifically this morning we're talking about remember and keep in mind as we go through this this morning we're talking about the disciplines and the chastings of the lord right the trials and the tribulations that come our way that the lord sends in our lives to deal with us i believe one of the things that unbelief does is it is it convinces us that God really isn't good. That when he disciplines us and he sends something difficult in our lives, 
It really isn't for our benefit. He's just doing it because we have this idea in our head. He's just up there with a big stick waiting to whack us over the head because we stepped out of line. Now, how many of you remember last week we looked at a bunch of different examples of the chastening of the Lord? It's not always directly as a result of sin. Job, the Bible says he was, he was a good man. He's basically perfect in all his ways, I believe it says. Yet, he had these terrible calamities come to him. Abraham, the Lord, of course, he had different times he had sinned, but, but Abraham, the chastenings were not necessarily sin as much as it was teaching him to be more dependent on the Lord, to, to leave behind worldly things. But specifically regarding unbelief, I believe a major cause of that is, is a, a, of an unbelieving heart is when we go through difficult times, we get this idea in our head, and I believe it's put there by Satan, that God really isn't out for our best interest. He's just trying to give us a hard time. That he's not looking out for, for what's best for us in eternity. And it's amazing because it calls it an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief is an evil thing, and it's extremely destructive. And it causes us to lose confidence in his love for us. The Lord doesn't put us through things because, like I said last week, he's not a big kid up there with a magnifying glass and we're a bunch of little ants running around. He just likes to watch us squirm. He's doing things for a specific reason. And as we looked at last week, what does he say? My thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. He sees things in a completely different way than we see them. And I'm sure once we get to heaven, we're going to realize all the things we went through in this life were pretty insignificant compared to what he was trying to do for us. So those are just a few reasons for a hard heart. There's, like I said, many others. It's kind of, I don't, I don't have time this morning to go deep, deep into, into every one of those. And obviously sin, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, <laughs> a broad term. But the deceitfulness of sin, and you can apply that to anything, that it, over time it, it hardens our hearts. Now I want to look at a few of the consequences of a hard heart. He says in Ezekiel that we looked at, but as for those who follow the desire for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads. That's kind of an ominous statement. I will recompense their deeds on their own heads. How many of you know gravity, and I've talked about this before, there, there's laws of physics, right? What goes up must come down. There's, there's, there's laws. Even airplanes at some point have to come down, right? Well, there's laws in the kingdom. There are certain things that, just like gravity, they're unequivocal. They're, they're, they're not debatable. They're just, it's just a simple fact of the kingdom. And one of them is, how many of you know the verse that says, you reap what you sow? Have you sown, not shall you? Actually, it doesn't say you reap what you sow. It says, have you sown, shall you not also reap? And how many of you know, and you guys are farmers, so you would know this much better than me, you don't just reap what you sow, you reap a whole lot more than you sow. And so often in life, I, I think we go through these difficult times, and we're stomping our feet, so to speak, and we're frustrated with the Lord, and we're becoming bitter over things, and it's kind of like, well, wait a second. <laughs> how do you know you're not reaping? I know my, my dad gave an example one time in his life of something he was going through, and he was upset with the Lord, and he was frustrated, and he felt the Lord speak to him, you're reaping what you sown what you sowed in this area of your life. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. We're real quick to forget the things that we sow. We just we won't enter his rest. A hard heart doesn't give us rest. How many of you know if you're a Christian, if you have a hard heart, there's just constant turmoil? Because you know, because the Holy Spirit is living within you, that what you're doing is wrong. You know that your attitude is wrong. You know that certain things in your life are out of line, and the Holy Spirit isn't going to give you rest. You're not going to enter into his rest if you have a hardness of heart. I want you to turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. As I said, we're going to read some scriptures this morning. I want to quickly go through this part. And this is going to be mainly the focus of today and, the, and, and of next week. And possibly the next week, depending on how, how long it, it goes. But Matthew chapter 13. You all have heard this parable, I'm sure, and have read it at some time. Chapter 13, verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered 
away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, so Jesus explains what he's talking about here. If anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. When tribulation, listen to this, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understand it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So Jesus goes through four different types of seed, four different types of, I should say, ground that the seed falls on. The wayside, right, where the birds come and eat it. The stony ground where the seed quickly springs up, but when the sun comes up, it withers away. The seed among the thorns where the thorns grow up and choke them. And then the, 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 the good soil where it actually yields a crop. And this morning, I want to focus mainly on the second one, which is the stony ground. The first one is pretty obvious, and we're going to get to this in a second. But I want to, just before I go on, I want to go on a little bit more into those consequences of a hard heart. He says, hearing they will not hear, having eyes they will not perceive seeing they will not see when you have a hard heart you won't be able to hear or understand spiritual things when the lord speaks into your life you can't hear when he begins to try to show you different things in your life you won't be able to see it because your heart's hard the seed can't take any root and as he said before they will not enter my rest how many of you know for a christian that's going to be extremely unrestful how many of you ever went through a trial in your life where you just, I, I just, I, I just, this re- very recently I, I had this thought, I just don't know what the Lord's saying to me. And this is why I'm preaching on this topic. Well, I need to do some heart examination. Maybe I've got some stony ground in my heart. The seed's not following in good places. Very often I, that, that's, a, that's a Christian reaction. Well, what's the Lord saying? What's the Lord doing? Why is he allowing this in my life? Well, maybe you're not seeing and hearing. Maybe you have a hard heart. God's purpose for the trials in our lives will not be fulfilled if we're having hard hearts. That's a big consequence. You want the Lord's purpose to be fulfilled in your life? I know I do. We would all say we do. Yet, hardness of heart will always prevent that. How many of you know there are no second causes for the Christian? Only God's workings. There aren't second causes. So often the world likes to say, yeah, it was luck, or yeah, just, it's just bad luck. There's no such thing as bad luck for a Christian. There's only God dealing with us. There's only God working in us, right? There's no second causes, only God's workings. There's no such thing as bad luck for a Christian. There's no such thing as happenstance. Just kind of happen. Coincidence is a, is a big word that people like to use. Ah, it's just kind of a bad, just a, just a coincidence. And that's good or bad. We don't have just bad coincidence or, or good coincidences. There's only God. There's only him working in our lives. And if we're having hard hearts, his purpose for the trials in our lives will not be fulfilled. As I mentioned recently, don't waste the trials in your life on bitterness because it's just going to keep happening. And and, and what, again, no rest. 
What a frustrating place to have to constantly be in where you're just going through the same thing over and over and over and over again and nothing's changing and you're just getting more frustrated and you're getting more upset and you're not having peace and you're not hearing from the Lord and the Lord isn't speaking to you and he's not, you're not seeing him do things in your life. Well, that's a consequence of a hard heart. And the first two types of soil mentioned here in this parable, the first one is hard ground. It says it, it falls by the wayside. And in, in those days, we didn't have big fancy combines like you guys didn't have any big buds rolling around so they had pathways through their fields and they would throw the seed out while they're on the pathway and of course inevitably some of that seed is going to fall into the ground well how many of you ever walked down a a trail a, a, a game trail or any type of trail in the woods the reason it's a trail is because nothing's growing there right people are walking on it back and forth it's it's hard it's packed down the seed can't take root there because it's constantly being disturbed and mostly it's packed down super hard and the seed can't penetrate it can't get into the dirt. And it says the birds came and ate the seed. This is likened to unbelievers who hear the word and don't understand it. The ground of their heart is too hard for the seed to penetrate. Have you ever tried to witness to someone and it was just like falling on deaf ears? It's because the, heart of their, the, 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 the ground of their heart is so hard the seed can't penetrate. <clears throat> hard hearts are a lot like water turning to ice. How many of you know before the ice comes in Montana winters, if you throw a rock on it, what's, what's going to happen? Bloop! It's going to go straight to the bottom, right? That water can't really hold any weight unless you have a boat. But for, for all intents and purposes, you can't drive a car onto the lake. We can't walk on the water. But how many of you know when all of a sudden you get that 10 or 12, 15 inches of ice, you can drive your truck on the water, and you can set up an ice house, you can go fishing, you can basically take anything you want. How many of you heard of that show, Ice Road Truckers? I mean, they take semi-trucks across the, the, the frozen north. Why? Because the ice, the water has gotten hard. Well, that's like a heart. When it's soft, the littlest thing, the littlest word from the Lord, the littlest trial from God can, can, can sink deep into it. But as it begins to harden and harden and harden and harden, it becomes like that ice, and pretty soon even a sledgehammer isn't going to do anything. Water bears no weight, but ice does. And that's the ground he's talking about when he says it falls by the wayside. And certainly as believers, we never want to get to that point. And I do think it's interesting, and this is just an aside to mention, in evil heart, in departing from the, liv the living God. How many people are out there preaching and teaching that, well, you can, you know, once you get saved, that's, that's the end of it. You can never lose your salvation. Well, why does he talk about the ability to depart from the living God? We can depart from the living God. That's why he's exhorting us. Be, be, brethren, be aware. Be careful that you don't do this. That your heart doesn't get so hard that it's like the unbelievers where the seed can't penetrate at all. But the second type of ground, and this is mainly what I want to focus on this morning as we go through this, is the stony ground. The seed sprang up quickly, but when the sun came up, it didn't have any roots, so it burned up. And it's amazing because he actually explicitly says what the sun is it says yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while when tribulation or persecution come because of the word immediately he stumbles Have you ever found yourself in that boat i know i have when the persecution when the sun the fire of god begins to get put to my life immediately i begin to stumble lord what are you doing this for why am i going through this and it's amazing to me how he says they receive it with joy they receive the word with joy. How many Christians love to receive the word with joy? That's why we're here this morning. We want to receive the word. And we certainly want to do it with joy, right? People love to hear the word of God as long as it's, you know, it's tickling their ears. And, and if it doesn't apply directly to their life, it's kind of like, you know, how many people walk out of church? Boy, I wish so-and-so was here. They really could have used that sermon, right? That's not, the, that's not the attitude of heart we need to have, but that's very often the attitude of heart we do have. And we like to receive the word with joy. As I said when I started this out, this applies to Christians. This is applicable to us. We've moved off of the ungodly now. We're talking to believers. We like to receive the word with joy, yet when the heat and fire of God's chastenings and disciplines begin to be applied to our lives, when the, the refiner's fire gets to get turned up a little bit, the seed begins to burn up. All of a sudden, the, the word isn't so joyous to us. It becomes more laborsome. We have no root. I want to look at how to have a soft heart this morning. How to have a soft heart. Hard hearts are bad. We know that. We've, we've kind of understood that so far. 
And that's great, but how do we have a soft heart? Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 says, So for your, oh, that's an interesting word. So, we reap what we sow. And how many of you know that applies to the negative as well as the positive? Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Listen to what he says. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So first we see we got to sow, and we got to sow in righteousness, and then we're going to reap his mercy. But I really want to focus on what he said there. Break up your fallow ground. As I said earlier, the you is an implied thing there. He's saying you break up your fallow ground. Certainly the Lord gives us all the tools and the implements to do that, but we have to put some sweat, blood, and tears into breaking up our fallow ground. It's our job to break up the fallow ground. And what does he say? It is time to seek the Lord. I believe one of the main keys in breaking up fallow ground in our hearts is seeking the Lord. Is seeking the Lord. How much time are we spending seeking God? How much time are we spending in our prayer? How much time are we spending in His Word? How much time are we spending in worship? When we come to Sunday, are we going through the motions? Are we truly here to seek the Lord? Seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. Another one, and this is more in line with what we've been looking at, is trials. We talked about last week, the discipline of the Lord. The discipline of the Lord. He says, He who received the seed in stony places is he who heard the word and immediately receives it for, with joy. For, but then he has no root in himself and endures only for a little while. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. It's an interesting phrase Job says in chapter 23, verse 16. For God, listen to this, for God maketh my heart soft and the Almighty troubleth me. Isn't that interesting? Job knew there was no second causes in his life. It wasn't even Satan. Because Satan couldn't have done a thing unless the Almighty gave him the freedom to do it. For God maketh my heart soft. And how does he do it? The Almighty troubleth me. Job was going through some pretty difficult circumstances. I'm quite confident, 100% positive, no one here has gone through anything like Job has went through. There is nothing immediate about the breakings of God. How many of you know when it... What, <laughs> I'm sure it's a lot easier now with Kim Fallow. But even with that, it takes a, it's a process. Breaking up fallow ground and preparing it to, to, receive, to receive good seed is a process. It doesn't just happen overnight. It isn't like you go out, kind of look at your field, wave your hand over it, and boom, it's ready to plant. It's not a magical thing. It, it takes some hard effort. It takes some hard work to do that. And back when this was all written... They didn't have, like I said, they didn't have big buds. They didn't have a big, what do they call those, Apache sprayers and all that stuff. They didn't have all these big machines. It was, it was some seriously intense physical labor to get a field ready to plant. His dealings with us are not immediate. <clears throat> There's nothing immediate about the breakings of God. Trials and tribulations have to last long enough. Listen to this. They have to last long enough to break up the hardness of our hearts. And here's the other thing. The harder the ground, the more difficult the trial. Right? The harder the ground, the le- the, if you got, I'm sure, the, if it's ground that you've never planted before, there's a lot more that goes into it than ground that's been planted over the last 20 years multiple times. The harder we allow our hearts to get, the harder the trial is going to be that we have to go through to get the ground broken up. He says, break up your fallow ground. Well, trials is one of the ways he does it. How many of you know I've said in the past few weeks, so often we're concerned about the destination when we really should be focused in on the journey. We want to all get to the mountaintop, yet we don't understand it's the valley part that the Lord wants us to, 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 to get. That, that's what he's using, the low, the low spots of our lives to break up the ground that's hard in our hearts. Excruciating experiences are the plow that he uses to cultivate hard hearts and break up the fallow ground. Have you ever known someone that was hard-hearted? I'm just asking. Have you ever known someone that had a really hard heart and then went through an intense, excruciating trial? 
what were they like afterwards? They were bitter, and the ones who were soft were really soft, right? They were mellowed. They were soft. When we go through the fire, when we go through these excruciating experiences, if we allow patience to have its perfect work, if we allow ourselves to be disciplined, knowing that the end game is to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our lives, then when we're all done, there's going to be a real change of heart. Our heart conditions are going to be in a lot better place. And the last thing I believe that is a major key in having a soft heart is simply asking. Asking. Seeking. Asking the Lord, Lord, give me a soft heart. Give me the tools I need. Give me the grace that when you use the plow of trials in my life, and it's not very fun, it's a bitter cup, that you'll give me the grace to go through it. We've got to ask Him. You have not because you ask not. I want to quickly look now at some ways to know, one specifically, that we have soft hearts. How many of you know what James has to say about the tongue? In Christianity, we have a lot of acceptable sins, so to speak. Right? We all know it's not okay to commit adultery. We don't go out murdering people. Well, hopefully, no one's going out and stealing stuff. Right? But there are sins that we kind of view not, not, we would say, well, yeah, no, that's not, you know, they're all, they're all bad. But actions speak louder than words, right? One of the sins that Christians kind of allow themselves to fall into, myself included, is words. Words. Gossip. If our hearts are soft then so will be our speech. The way, and I don't mean just, I, I want to I move even on from, from what we're talking about to how we talk to people. The way that we talk to people, the, 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 the voice inflection we have, the, 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 the gentleness of our speech or the lack of gentleness in our speech says a lot about whether we have a soft heart or not. When I'm barking at my kids, my heart's not really soft towards them at the moment. But when I'm cuddling them and I'm loving on them and I'm kind of, hey, you know, you little munchkin, come on over here, I want to kiss your cheeks, you know. That, that has a much more of a soft heart towards them. And the two younger ones have much more kissable che- cheeks right now. I'm always loving on them and bothering them and pestering them. But I have a very soft speech when I'm doing that with them. But when they're naughty, my speech is not very soft. And that's indicative of the attitude I'm having with them. I'm upset with them. I'm aggravated with them. Well, if we have soft hearts, our speech will be soft. Luke 6, 45, Jesus says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Another way it says, another version, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But I like this translation. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. If we have hardness of hearts, what do you think is going to come out of our mouth based on what Jesus is saying here? Hard speech, right? Proverbs 16, I want you to just listen to these verses for a moment. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the body. Proverbs 15, 4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. You want to be an effective witness to the ungodly? (coughs) Excuse me. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. The opposite of that is also true. A harsh tongue is not a tree of life. It breaks the spirit. (coughs) How many of you know that the chastenings of God produce broken up hearts? When he begins to cultivate our our hearts, it produces a broken up ground, which allows the good seed to take root. And if good seed takes root, what happens to it? What what happens at harvest time? There's an abundance of fruit, right? I want to tell you this morning, the problem is never, ever, ever the quality of the seed. The quality of the seed is never the problem in our lives. It's the quality of the ground of our hearts. That is so often the problem. Where it falls, what type of ground it's falling on, is what matters. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, 
and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, I've heard that verse my whole life. See if there be any wicked way within me. And I think to myself, well, hmm, you wouldn't have to look very hard in my life. You know, what's the whole point of that? Lord, see if there be any wicked way within me. Well, <laughs> that's kind of obvious. I could give you a whole list right now without thinking very hard. But I like what he says. He says, and lead me in the way everlasting. Find the wickedness, find the hardness of my hearts, change it, and then lead me in the way that's everlasting. How many of you know the Bible likens us to clay and God to the potter, right? I can guarantee you God does not mold hard clay. If you ever have watched someone molding clay, it's a very soft thing that they're molding. I think it's more than even, it's softer than even Play-Doh. That, how many of you know that gets hard actually over time if it's left out in the air? But it's a very soft thing. God doesn't mold with hard hearts. He can't. It's not moldable. So what does he have to do? He has to pound it and work with it until it is soft enough to be useful. So often we go through these things, and again, as I said, the disciplines and the dealings and the chastings of the Lord that he talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, and it's just frustrating. And Lord, why are you doing this to me? Well, <laughs> son, daughter, I don't work with hard clay. You've got to be soft. You, you are always telling me how you want to be conformed to my image and how you want to walk in my ways and you want to live a godly life and walk circumspectly. Well, this is the tool that I'm, this is the things I have to stick you through to get you to the point where you're actually moldable. Just look at the Bible. Look at the mighty men of God. We mentioned some of them last week. David, right? He had to go through some pretty bitter waters until he was the man after God's own heart that fulfilled all God's will for his life. Moses had to sit in a stinky desert. Brother Bob was talking about that with a bunch of nasty sheep, which back then that was like the real, real unpleasant job. I guess that would be like being a sewer man. No one wanted to be a shepherd. That was not a, that was not a, a well-looked-upon job. Daniel went through many trials. Joseph, talk about being molded and, 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 and seemingly without cause. That guy went through a, a tremendous amount. Job. I don't even need to get into him. I think you all know how that story went. God does not mold with hard clay. How many of you know a heart of flesh, right, is soft, which means it's a lot more susceptible to wounding? Is it, is it easy to wound a stone? Last time I checked, it's not. You can basically beat it with a hammer, and maybe you'll chip a piece off of it if it's a really hard stone. Think of diamonds come to mind. I think they say, what is it? The only thing that cut diamonds is other diamonds, right? <clears throat> it's very difficult to cut. It's very difficult to chip. <clears throat> Whereas a soft heart, flesh, it's very easy to cut. It's very easy to hurt yourself if you're not careful. I remember growing up, my dad is just, he's kind of, a, kind of reminds me of some other people here in this congregation. He's a real force of nature when he works, and he, he's always cutting himself and banging himself and scraping himself and kind of hurting himself. <clears throat> Well, that's what happens to flesh. It's very easy to hurt. It's very easy to cut. It's very easy to scratch. But a heart of stone, it's not. Spiritually speaking, a heart of flesh is very quickly smitten when God rebukes and chastens. When the arrows of the Lord come, when the Bible talks about in Hebrews, the sword of the Lord that divides between soul and spirit and joint and marrow, when that begins to cut on us, it has some effect. It quickly cuts us. A heart of stone doesn't have the same effect. A soft heart is tender towards the things of the Lord. And it has a conscience that is easily pricked by sin. The hard heart, eh. Like Psalms talks about it, wipe, the wicked wipe their mouth and say, what have we done? What, what, we, we, you know, we're innocent of all wrongdoing. A soft heart isn't like that. A soft heart is quickly pricked. Have you ever sinned in your life and immediately you were convicted by the Holy Spirit? That's a sign of a soft heart. But have you ever had sin in your life that you, over time, the deceitfulness of sin, desensitized and became more calloused to that sin in that area? That's a hardening of the heart. And as we conclude this morning, I want to talk about the benefits of a tender heart. I just mentioned one. One, a conscience that is easily pricked by sin and a soft heart that is tender towards the things of the Lord. <clears throat> James chapter 1, he starts out and he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's an interesting statement. Count it joy when you fall into trials. 
Why? He says in verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If we have a soft heart, a tender heart towards the Lord, we will have the patience to endure. And I love how he says that you will be perfect and you will be complete, lacking nothing. Job 23 says, When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. How many of you have ever been in that point in your life? You just felt like you didn't even know where you were going. Like, Lord, I am totally confused. I am totally bewildered as to what you're doing right now. I think Job probably had that feeling. And if you read him, you can kind of pick up on that. I, I, basically, it's like, I wish I was never born, he, he says. Then he says, he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. We even know what the refiner's fire speaks of. Why do we go through, why does the Bible talk about a refiner's fire? What is the end game of the refiner's fire? To purify the gold, to get rid of the impurities. My foot is held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and not turned aside. He performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. God was working in Job's life, and he knew it. He says, he performeth the thing for me, that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. The Almighty maketh my heart soft, he says, and he troubleth me. But why? What was the whole purpose of that? Because when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. A soft, contrite heart is the opposite of a hard, prideful heart. Right? As I started out this morning, a soft heart, another word for that is a humble heart. Soft and humble are the same thing. Psalms 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord, remember, the benefits of a tender heart, The Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart. And saves such as be of a contrite spirit. Another verse in Psalm says that he is near to the humble, but the the proud he knows from afar off. You ever heard that verse? You ever read that verse? The proud he knows from afar off. Do you want to be near the Lord? Do you want to draw near to him? He says, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Well, a broken heart is one of the things that he draws near to. Break up your fallow ground. Soft hearts allow the seed of His Word to be planted. And it brings forth fruit. We would all say we want the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, right? Kindness, mercy, grace. All these different things. We certainly want, would say we want the the seed of His Word to be planted in our lives and to bear fruit. But what, what comes first? What's the first step in planting a field? Breaking up the hard ground. A tender heart is quickly willing to yield, and it has a longing to be free from the burdens of sin. And as I close this morning, I want to quickly read from a man that I I like to quote often. It's called The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, and it's a passage on hearts of flesh that I felt was very applicable to what we're looking at this morning. He says, What is meant by a heart of flesh? I mean a heart that can feel on account of sin. A heart that can bleed when the arrows of God stick fast in it. It means a heart that can yield when the gospel makes its attacks. A heart that can be impressed when the seal of God's word comes upon it. It means a heart that is warm. For life is warm. A heart that can think. A heart that can inspire. A heart that can love. Putting all in one. A heart of flesh means that new heart and right spirit which God giveth to regenerate. But wherein does this heart of flesh consist? Wherein does its tenderness consist? Well, its tenderness consists of three things. There is tenderness of conscience. Men who have lost their stony hearts are afraid of sin. Even before sin, they are afraid of it. The very shadow of evil across their path frightens them. The temptation is enough for them. They flee from it as from a serpent. They would not dally and toy with it lest they be betrayed. Their conscience is alarmed even at the approach of evil and away they fly and in sin, for even tender hearts do sin, they are uneasy. 
As well might a man seek to obtain quiet rest on a pillow stuffed with thorns as the tender conscience get any peace while a man in sinning. And then after sin, here comes the pinch. The heart of flesh bleeds as though it were wounded to its very core. It hates and loathes and detests itself that ever it should have gone astray. Ah, stony heart, you can think of sin with pleasure. You can live in sin and not care about it. And after sin, you can roll the sweet morsel under your tongue and say, Who is my master? I care for none. My conscience does not accuse me. But not so the tender broken heart. Before sin... And in sin and after sin, it smarts and cries out to God. So also in duty as well in sin, the new heart is tender. Hard hearts care nothing for God's commandment. But hearts of flesh wish to be obedient to every statute. Only let me know my master's will and I will do it. The hearts of flesh, when they feel that the commandment has been omitted or that the command has been broken, mourn and lament before God. There are some hearts of flesh that cannot forgive themselves if they have been lax in prayer, if they have not enjoyed the Sabbath day, if they feel that they have not given their hearts to God's praise as they should. These duties which hearts of stone trifle with and despise hearts of flesh value and esteem. If the heart of flesh could have its way, it would never sin. It would be as perfect as its Father who is in heaven, and it would keep God's command without flaw of omission or of commission. Have you, dear friends, such a heart of flesh as this? I believe a heart of flesh, again, is tender not only with regard to sin and duty, but with regard to suffering. A heart of stone can hear God blasphemed and laugh at it, but our blood runs cold to hear God dishonored when we have a heart of flesh. A heart of stone can bear to see its fellow creatures perish and despise their destruction, but the heart of flesh is very tender over others. Faith, its pity would reclaim and snatch the firebrand from the flame. A heart of flesh would give its very lifeblood if it might but snatch others from going down to the pit. For its bowels yearn and its soul moves towards its fellow sinners who are on the broad road to destruction. Have you, oh have you, such a heart of flesh as this? Then to put it in another light, the heart of flesh is tender in three ways. It is tender in conscience. Hearts of stone makes no bones, as we say, about great mischiefs. But hearts of flesh repent, even at the very thought of sin. To have indulged a foul imagination, to have flattered a lustful thought, and to have carried it to tarry even for a minute is quite enough to make a heart of flesh grieved and rent before God with pain. The heart of stone says when it has done great iniquity, Oh, it is nothing, it is nothing. Who am I that I should be afraid of God's law? But not so the heart of flesh. Great sins are little to the stony heart. Little sins are great to the heart of flesh. If little sins there be, conscience in the heart of stone is seared with a hot iron. Conscience in the heart of flesh is raw and very tender. Like the sensitive plant, it coils up its leaves at the slightest touch. It cannot bear the presence of evil. It is like a delicate consumptive who feels every wind and is affected by every change of atmosphere. God gives, such us, gives us such a blessedly tender conscience as that. Then again, the heart of flesh grows tender of God's will. Our wills is a great blusterer, and it is hard to bring them down to subject himself to God's will. When you have a man's conscience on God's side, you have only half the battle if you cannot get his will. The old maxim, convince a man against his will, he's of the same opinion still, is true with regard to this as well as regard to anything else. Oh, there are some of you that know the right, but you will do the wrong. You know that it is evil, but you will pursue it. Now when the heart of flesh is given, the will bends like a willow, quivers like an aspen leaf in every breath of heaven, and bows and bows like a dogwood tree in every breeze of God's Spirit. The natural will is stern and stubborn, and you must rend it up by the roots, but the renewed will is gentle and pliable, feels the divine influence, and sweetly yields to it. To complete the picture, in the tender heart, there is a tenderness of the affections. A hard heart does not love God, but the renewed heart does. The hard heart is selfish, cold, cold, and stoic. Why should I weep for sin? Why should I love the Lord? Why should I give my heart to Christ? The heart of flesh says. The heart of flesh says, Thou knowest I love thee, dearest Lord, but oh, I long to soar far from this world of sin and woe and to love thee even more. Well, may God give us a tenderness of affection that we may love God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. Proverbs 4, verse 23 says, Keep 
your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Out of the abundance of the heart, our mouth speaks. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Do you want to be pliable? Do you want to be teachable? Do you want to be able to be instructed? Do you want the trials and the cultivating plows of God to actually take effect, to actually break up the fallow ground so that the seed can bring forth a harvest and the fruits of the Spirit in your life? Then you have to have a tender heart. You have to allow those trials to actually do what they're supposed to and break up the hard ground of our hearts. Amen? Father, we ask this morning, Lord, that you would break up the hard ground of our hearts. Lord, that when the seed of the word comes, that, Lord, it would be able to take deep root. That, Lord, when the trials and the tribulations are formed by you, Lord, that when the Almighty troubleth us and make our hearts soft, that, Lord, we would be yielded. That we will submit ourselves, Lord. That we would let patience have its perfect work within our hearts, Lord, within our lives. That, Lord, we would not despise the chastenings of God, but, Lord, that they would yield the peaceable fruits of righteousness in us, O God. That, Lord, our speech would be tender and soft and kind and gracious. That our actions would be the same, Lord, that they would be kind and merciful that, Lord, we would sow in righteousness and reap in mercy. Father, there are so many areas of our hearts that are hard and stony and rocky. Lord, we don't want the seed to be plucked away. Lord, we don't want the seed to wither away. But, Father, we want the seed to do what it's meant to do, Lord, to bear fruit. Father, we ask that you would help us this very week to begin to break up the fallow ground, that we would begin to seek your face desperately, that, Lord, we would allow the things of you that are sent our way to do what they're meant to, that, Father, we would be changed into your likeness, that we would take up our cross and follow you, Father. Lord, we ask that you would bind these words to our hearts, Lord, that the seed of this word would go deep within us this morning and that it would begin to bring forth life. Lord, give us the grace and the strength to follow after you wholeheartedly. Lord, to walk in your ways and keep your commandments, we pray, Father. And to delight ourselves in your word. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.